Hey Lavish fam, welcome back to the channel. Um, so today it's Friday. Um, it is the day before we leave for vacation and it's another extremely gloomy, rainy day outside. But in my last vlog, I kind of um, danced around um, a topic about Dallas, which really is not a topic about Dallas. Dallas. Um, it just happened to be uh, where I was when I got <clears throat> um, the results from my latest uh, MRI and lumbar puncture. So um, <clears throat> a lot of you guys have been around for a long time on my channel yeah I'm saying long time I mean literally this channel has been I think I dropped my first vlog literally two years ago so it's been two years two full years so this is the two-year anniversary of living lavishly with Nisha um, and I appreciate each and every last one of you all uh, so a lot of you all know that I have two brain conditions and um, they're chronic so there's no cures for them and you I've talked about them I've told you all I've had three surgeries thus far um, and you all know about last year when I woke up temporary paralyzed and ended up in the hospital for a few days and then I had another surgery uh, following that. Um, but for people who don't know, we're going to back up. So um, the two conditions that I have, one is called Chiari Malformation Type 1. And Chiari Malformation Type 1 is a condition in which your cerebellum, which is the part of your brain that sits in the back, um, protrudes outside of your magnum forum. Your magnum forum is the canal, the opening, the canal that goes through so that your CSF fluid can flow up and down. Your neck is also connected, the neck muscles are also connected to that, but it's an opening. So your cerebellum has what's called tonsils on them. So just like in your throat, there's tonsils that sits on your cerebellum. So what happens is these tonsils should be sitting above your magnum form. But, my, but when you have Chiari malformation type 1, those tonsils sit through there. And they cause a blockage. And so that the CSF fluid sometimes cannot flow properly as well as um, it can cause you to have neuro like issues because your cerebellum controls movement. So it could be, you know, like your legs, it could be whatever, you know. Um, some people, a lot of people with Chiari malformation type 1, they're born with it. But a lot of times you don't tend to have symptoms if you even have any until you're probably in your late teens up to your 40s. Well, um, that that's literally what happened to me. So um, I also, I, I started having all of these neuro type conditions or symptoms where like I was um, having issues with walking, um, where my legs would pretty much just kind of give out. Uh, I was having um, like just really bad leg pain, like almost a restless leg syndrome type situation. Then it became my right arm that I basically was not, it was just basically there. I didn't have... I had a complete, like, you know how when you sleep on your arm and it has that numbness feeling or whatever, it goes to sleep, as people say. Well, I had that, like, 24-7. Thankfully, I'm left-handed, so I was able to kind of, like, mask it when I was at work. Um, but <clears throat> it would be weak. It would be hard. I would wake up and it wouldn't even do anything. It will just kind of be like a paralysis on my arm and I would be, like, shaking it. 
Um, then it started getting to where I started, well, I was also having these really bad right-sided migraines to where eventually my peripheral vision and sight started going on my right side. Um, I just had a bunch of neuro symptoms that were just constantly adding up and, um, no doctor was able to really feel it, figure it out when we were stationed in North Dakota. They just kept sending me to specialists. Um, and you know, just trying to, I mean, treat symptoms. I'm not a, a, a person who believes in taking a bunch of medications. So when they would try to throw like, you know, muscle relaxers or pain meds at me and I was just like, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for answers. So fast forward to moving, we got stationed back here and I went to, um, a new doctor and he were, he was younger and um so he was trying newer things you know versus people doctors who've been in the field for a long time a lot of times they get stuck in their ways and they don't you know they just kind of well she's just here for this but long story short this doctor you know did a bunch of blood work that other doctors had never done and Fast forward to me being diagnosed with Chiari malformation. Um, it was found on a brain MRI. Um, and because so he sent me to a neurosurgeon. Because at this point, I was past the neurologist point. I needed it because I was barely functioning. Um, I was literally pushing my body to the max, working as a nurse in school, trying to manage my family, you know, all of the things that were going on in my life, um, and working more than one job and just all types of stuff. And, um, <clears throat> when I went to see my neurosurgeon, that's when he said, you know, looking at my scans, uh, he did not believe I was born with Chiari malformation type one as most people are. He believed that I acquired it, meaning it was a secondary condition, second to idiopathic inter intracranial hypertension. Idiopathic meaning no known cause, intra meaning inside, cranial my brain, hypertension meaning high pressure. Um, it used to be called pseudo tumor cerebri, meaning false tumor inside of your brain. Um, but now they call it idiopathic endocranial hypertension. So what that basically means is your brain believes, believes that there's a tumor. So false tumor, your brain believes there's a false tumor, but there's not. So your brain is basically attacking itself. It's trying to, because that's what your body does. Your body is made for healing. It is made to take care of itself, to fight off infection, to fight off foreign things. That is what it does. That is what it's built for. That's just what your body does. But when there is nothing actually there, but your brain thinks it's there. There is nothing that a doctor can do to fix what something thinks, you know, what your body thinks. So, um, my brain basically produces CSF fluid at a very high rate to try to flush out something that does not exist. So because it went for so long undiagnosed, it eventually pushed my cerebellum through my magnum form and blocked the flow of my CSF fluid, also putting a strain on my cerebellum because it's stuck in that, mag in that hole, that magnum form, and it caused me to have even more symptoms. These two conditions are not complementary to each other. They actually are antagonistic to each other, meaning they just don't match, period. Um, so the only medicine that's on the, on the like, that's available for people with pseudotumor cerebri 
is called Diamox. It is a sodium, I'm sorry, it is a sofa medication and I am highly allergic to sofa. Highly. But I was also extremely, you know, um, I was also extremely symptomatic from the Chiari. So at this point, my only option was to have brain surgery. I'm going to insert pictures at the end so people who are a little more squeamish and don't like to see stuff like that, you don't have to see it. I will give you a warning before I post those pictures. So um, at that point, that was my only option. And after talking to my neurosurgeon in detail, Dante and I decided that would be my best option because I was not living I was not functioning the way that I could be, you know, um, and I had complete faith in him and he, but he made sure he let me know this will be the worst pain you've ever felt in your life. There's not a C-section. There's not a, a contraction. There is not anything that would amount to the amount of pain that you will be in from this surgery. I had what's called um, a craniotomy, craniectomy, decompression surgery. Basically, they opened a part of my skull and removed it. So the bottom part of my skull was removed so that, because they can't push your brain back up. They literally have to take off a part of your skull. So mine was opened, removed, and then a mesh opening was put over my <laughs> over my cerebellum so that my cerebellum could breathe and not have the pressure put up on it that my magnum form was pressing on it so with that being said that was my very first surgery um the next day when i woke up i was temporarily paralyzed from the waist down. It had never happened in any of his surgeries, um, but thankfully it was a temporary situation and it resolved itself within about 20 hours or so. I was able to back move and I had to go through physical therapy to get my strength back, but by the grace of God, I survived it. Everything was good um, and here I am. Um, he thought that having that surgery could possibly help with the idiopathic endocranial hypertension as well and allow for, because he removed part of my skull, it would allow for that extra CSF fluid to pass freely um, through that magnum forum, but it didn't. Before I end up leaving the hospital, I end up having to have another lumbar puncture to drain the excess fluid off of my brain. Hold on. This is emotional, y'all. Um, but I felt like this is something that a lot of people have no idea. Conditions people don't even know about. And a lot of doctors don't even know what to look for. Um, and even me being a registered nurse and my friend Sakina being a nurse practitioner, she and I was just talking about this in Dallas, like how when we were in school, we never heard of Chiari malformation type 1. Never heard of Chiari malformation. It was never taught to us. Of course, we heard about intracranial hypertension, you know, but we never heard about Chiari. It was not a topic that was discussed. Um, and it's still kind of like one of these mystery things that they're still learning about, you know, um, and learning a lot from. So there's not a lot of, you know, it's not a whole lot of information on it. So when I was like diagnosed with it, I was struggling to find answers. So anyway, before I left the hospital, I ended up having a lumbar puncture to drain all the fluid that had once again built up on my brain. So my doctor said, you know, my neurosurgeon, he said, you know, your issue is because you went undiagnosed for so long, you don't have 
the space in your brain where your ventricles is to put what's called a ventricular shunt. Most people who have like hydrocephaly where a lot of kids are typically born with. I mean not a lot of kids but it's usually something that is diagnosed in babies when they come out with the like larger heads or the or their heads start to get is larger than normal. They may have what's called hydrocephalus which is a build up of fluid on their brain. I don't know really what why one is called hydrocephalus and the other one is called idiopathic endocranial hypertension. I have no idea. But they're able to get what's called a ventricular shunt. A ventricular shunt is is the ideal shunt for people with buildup of fluid in their brain. It is it's easy to control. Um it's inside your brain. It doesn't typically malfunction. There's never really any type of like um, extra surgeries that are needed. The doctors can turn it up, turn it down with a, uh, without having to go in and do another, you know, surgery. It is ideal for people with these conditions. But because I don't have enough space in my ventricular, you know, spaces, I was not a candidate. For that shunt. The shunt that they offered me is called what is called a lumbar peritoneal shunt. The shunt that I have literally goes in between basically my <laughs> tonsils, my cerebellum tonsils. So it goes up between there and then it goes all the way down my spine. Here sits the mech the the um the hardware and then it goes around my side and empty and empties into my stomach where it drains the extra fluid so I have a scar here a scar around my side and one down my back the problem with it is it's very faulty it's very faulty it has a six-year lifespan and it's like a straw it's like a straw so um the mechanism there is no if it if it's if it malfunctions there is nothing that can be manually done you literally have to have it replaced so if you think about it it's like a straw so it's literally just kind of draining the fluid through this little straw type of thing but when you basically pull something with a straw you also pull my tonsils so they don't go together because you're basically suctioning right up against something that's already where it should not be. So it's tugging. So because it's so fragile, it, 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 it's hard for me to do daily things. So when I was working in labor and delivery, you don't really think about yourself when a woman is pregnant and her baby is tanking. You literally react and think later. I was known for reacting. I would turn patients on my own. I would lift things on my own. I would do all these things. And, and I don't even know for a fact if that's where I broke my shunt. I don't know. Because I had been doing so many things. I had been doing building furniture. I had been working at the hospital at the busiest labor and delivery in basically the entire United States. I had been doing so many things that one morning I woke up paralyzed. Home alone and my body had literally shut down. I was not able to do anything. I couldn't lift my head. I couldn't lift my hands. I was paralyzed home alone. Thankfully, after a couple of days, maybe 36 hours, I think, I was back moving and back to normal. But my shunt was once again, well, well was broken. Um, and I had only had it for a year and a half. I ended up having my shunt replaced. Thankfully, it was just the hardware portion. I did not have to have the entire thing, you know, replaced. So it was just the part that sits right here in my back. Um, so I had it replaced. 
and I have not been back to labor and delivery. However, I have had jobs in nursing. But the more I do, the more my symptoms tend to creep back up. There is no medicine, once again, for my symptoms or my, I mean, there is no medicine to fix my conditions. I am literally like at the mercy of Tylenol or a, maybe even a muscle relaxer to help me go to sleep. I do not talk about my pain often. I don't even tell my family when I'm in pain 99% of the time unless it's at the point to where it's debilitating to where my head feels like it's gonna explode or where it's you know I'm just I'm struggling I I'm one of those people that believe if I got up today today's a good day if I was able to walk today today was a good day if I woke up today today is a good day and I have another day to try and spend with my family or to, to you know to do something positive you know um, so I found out recently that I have hypothyroidism which my past doctor who did find a Chiari malformation never treated me for I guess because there was so many other things going on with with me you know that were more important so with that being said I've gained 30 plus pounds in the last two plus years three years yeah three years um, which is also bad for my conditions so I've been taking thyroid medicine levothyroxine to try to help me of course with my thyroid problem hypothyroidism um, but everything takes time um, so with so once again um, I'm having a lot of symptoms from my two conditions uh, I don't talk about it I just y'all y'all just keep seeing me smiling and doing daily things but I'm at the point where life is once again hard. I'm unable to do the job that I that I love, which is being a nurse. Um, I'm not a person who believes in rolling over and just whoa whoa it is me. Um, and I don't want to push these things off on my family either, you know, so I get these comments, um, all the time on here about like, oh, you should do this or you should buy this or you should like, I'm literally like, this is my only income at this time is YouTube and I'm trying to save and prepare for the surgery that I'm about to have. While I was in Dallas, I had been waiting. As you guys know, I had told you all I had been going to the doctor. Um, I had some tests done. I've had, I, I was having some issues with swallowing. I thought it was um, my thyroid being swollen, but comes to find out it was not my thyroid. Hold on, y'all. <laughs> uh, it was not my thyroid that was swollen. Uh, I did have a lumbar puncture and I thought it was my shut was broken which I can deal with I can, I can deal with because it's not that invasive the surgery is not that invasive 
It's a very simple surgery. I stayed in the hospital maybe 24 hours. It's not that painful. I can deal with it. When I got to Dallas, I had been waiting almost two weeks for answers from my neurosurgeon. And they called. And I knew it was worse than what I thought because she was kind of talking in circles and trying to do the sandwich method. The better news, the bad news, and then, you know, the, the better news. I literally have to repeat my first surgery. I have an abundance of scar tissue that has built around my cerebellum tonsils and the opening of my magnum forum area that is obstructing the flow of my CSF fluid. Now, when you have, whenever you you have surgery, your body does produce scar tissue, and which is to be expected. But for some reason, my body has made way too much of it, and it's causing me to have all of those symptoms that I was having in the beginning. As I stated. It, no surgery is ever like good. Anytime you go be put to sleep, there's always a chance that you could not wake up. I've had lots of surgeries. I've had over 10 plus surgeries. Not all, only three of them dealing with with my um, brain situation. But uh, I've had lots of them. The reason I'm so sad is because this surgery is like no other. I have a very high pain tolerance. A very high pain tolerance. I had C-sections with my kids and did not take not one pain medicine. Not one. Um. Even being in labor and having contractions, I never even got an epidural. I got put to sleep for my emergency C-section after being in labor for 14 hours. I have a very high pain tolerance. But this surgery, <laughs> it's different. It's different. Having your brain or your skull opened up is a pain like no other. And, and the fact that it's your brain, period, is, is, is hard. I'm thankful that I am, I already had this trip planned to Thailand because I need, I need this right now. I need this trip to be amazing because I know I'm about to have a battle when I come back. I don't know my exact surgery date just yet. They are scheduling it because I had to think about it um, for a few days. And I finally agreed to do it yesterday. So, I don't know just yet what the date is, but I will definitely keep you all posted. Um, I don't know uh, what this channel will look like once I have the surgery. My friend Sakina thinks I should document my journey for anyone who 
may or may not be going through this or don't know or someone who may see this vlog and also just was diagnosed with one of these conditions and don't know what to do or just don't know um, because a lot like I said I didn't know um, so that is the plan I, I'm going to it at this time I feel like I want to document it whether it's just a couple minutes here and there just to kind of say hey I'm okay I don't know um, at this time I say yes but I don't know what this surgery is gonna like how I'm gonna be affected the way if it's gonna be hold on hold please um, uh, yeah so I don't know but at this time that is my plan I am not on here about to give y'all my cash app asking for money because that's just not the person that I am I, I did I did not do this for any type of gain um, so I don't want y'all to think that either that's just not my character I literally did this vlog for awareness and also transparency I'm always telling you guys you know that I feel like the only way for you all to be able to really know me or get to know me is if I am open and a lot of times when I'm vlogging there is of course cuts I take stuff out I take uh, you know whatever and people think that they know or know me based off of off of those things and it's like and I get these sometimes pretty hateful or mean comments and I bleed just like everyone else and people have no idea the pain and the the things that I go through while still trying to vlog and earn an income to help support my family um but I say all that to say that all I ask is that y'all keep me in y'all prayers um this is definitely probably the hardest vlog I've ever done um but I think I'm going to go ahead and end it. Um, and I'm going to wait to drop it while I'm in Thailand. Because during that time I plan not to even check anything. I, I want to be, even though I'm going to vlog that trip, I, I think I'm just going to disconnect from my phone or emails. Um, during that time and just vlog and because I need even though at first I almost decided I was not going to vlog Thailand I was going to just try to enjoy the moment but financially it's not the best idea I you know need whatever income I make from that to supplement while I am recovering from this procedure so there will be vlogs um, from Thailand and as I stated I'm gonna go ahead and end this vlog so I can go ahead and start finish getting ready for tomorrow um, I just want y'all to know I appreciate each and every last one of y'all I appreciate the all of the support I I appreciate all of the nice comments y'all just don't know how that makes me feel when you guys tell me that you all appreciate me 
or that y'all enjoyed my vlogs or that y'all feel like y'all are my family because I feel like y'all are my family as well, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm truly going to go ahead and end this vlog and I will keep you guys posted um, on my on my surgery date and um, what's next. Uh, I'm sure I missed some things I probably wanted to talk about, but um, at this point, that's another one of my conditions. <laughs> that's another one of my symptoms, is that I tend to know what I want to say, but my brain does not connect, and I struggle with words that are. I know what they are. But my mind, my mouth won't speak what my brain is telling me. Weird. Um, but for now, that's what I have. I don't, I, I don't know what else. So I'm going to end this and I will see you guys when I return from Thailand. Thanks and I love you guys. Bye.